So I'm going to start, and uh, I'm uh, Matteo, and I'm actually at Microsoft, uh, but uh, uh, I work on this project while I was at uh, UCLA. And basically, this project is about the debugging uh, distributed workflow, specifically Spark. And basically, what we found in that is that uh, there was this evolution in uh, distributed processing, starting from MapReduce and ending in uh, Spark right now. And while all these uh, distributed processing, they got evolved and the, the performance got improved a lot, all the, um, still these systems are really hard to debug. And there was no many uh, evolvement on the debugging side. And uh, basically the only things that you can do is uh, when you submit your job to your cluster is either uh, reading the logs when, the job, uh, when the, your, your job fails or at the end of, a, of the execution. Or if you want, you can take samples of the of the data set, bring the samples on your uh, local laptop, and then doing some uh, debugging uh, locally. Of course, this is something that not always works because you have to be very careful now you take the sample. If you take the wrong sample, you may uh, think that the, the, there is no error in your data set or your program, and when you're trying to class, it, actually everything fails. And basically, with this project, we want to uh, kind of provide a full fledged debugging system for uh, Apache Spark. And this is actually a project that. Uh, um, was going on for quite a while, around three years, and everything started from the Titan Data Provenance Systems, that is basically a system that tried to uh, provide lineage, not as the RDD level, as Spark already provided, but at the single uh, record level. So basically, given your, uh, an output record, you can basically trace all the, the parcel and the input record that generated the particular uh, output record. Then on, on top of this system, we start to build more uh, other features that the normal GDB like debugger has, such as breakpoint and watchpoint. And we also um, implemented a system that helped the user when you basically submit a query and you want to fix the query on, on, uh, and execute that, the, the fixed query as soon as you can. And we provide a sort of interactive and it, uh, uh, incremental uh, uh, system to kind of help you with that. And finally, we have a new system that is able to do automatic debugging for you. And I will uh, explain a little bit how it works that system in the, in the next slide. So basically, the feature that we're going to show today are mainly five. So we have a simulated breakpoint, uh, we have a watchpoint, we have a cash culprit identification, and a backward tracing feature, and finally, the automated fault localization uh, uh, system. I'm going through uh, really briefly in all, all these five points, and then we'll start, we'll show you a, a, a demo in the, remaining, in the remaining time. So about, about the simulated breakpoint. So actually, uh, having a breakpoint on your program running on the cluster is kind of, uh, it's not really well defined. What does it mean to have a breakpoint on your application while it's running on the cluster? Does all the machine to have to stop on a certain point, or how does it work, right? Uh, so what we come up with is the, with this notion of simulated breakpoint. So basically, uh, what we do is, uh, uh, while your, your, your application is running, we, when you, you set a simulated breakpoint, we uh, maintain the state so that when, and we leave the, the application run until the end. So that eventually when the, the, the application finishes, you can, you can kind of uh, um, uh, look inside the state to see what, what, what is happening. And what we also provide is a, is a way to kind of uh, do real-time code fix. So when you fix the breakpoint and your application is still running, you can inspect the state and say, okay, uh, there's something wrong here. I want to change my code on the fly. We provide a way to, to but uh, you can do that. You can fix your function and you automatically ship the code and re-execute re it from the breakpoint break on. And of course, the problem with, the, with the, this notion of breakpoint is that if the state uh, that we maintain on the cluster at your breakpoint, uh, at, uh, at this breakpoint can be really large, gigabyte side, right? And it's kind of hard to sift through all these state if you want to understand what can be a possible cause of the problem. So uh, in order to fix this, this issue, we provide also a watchpoint. And watchpoint is, um, is nothing more than a, a, a function that you can, that is user defined. It's a sort of predicate, so that tell, you tell the system, okay, I'm really interested in this particular um, records in the full state of the breakpoint, and we basically are able to, to, to ship this function to, into the cluster, and we, provide, and we uh, stream all the records to your local node so that you can uh, sift through only the record they're in, interested in. Uh, another feature that we provide is cache cru cru culprit uh, uh, remediation, and basically when you have this feature enabled, inst when you have your task that failed while there's an execution on, in the cluster, instead of showing just a really low level uh, 
a error that most of the time doesn't make sense to you, we actually provide you the, uh, the record that caused the particular error. And together with the record, we provide a, a new life so that you can either modify the record on the fly. So if you modify the record, then we ship the fixed record back to the cluster and we resume the computation. Or you can simply tell uh, uh, to skip completely the record. Or what you can also do is trace to input. So as I said before, we have this data provenance uh, functionality and when you trace to input, we basically are able to, um, uh, sorry, we are basically able to trace backward and, and show to you all the input record that generated a particular record that caused the fault, the failure. So it is kind of easier for you to kind of understand uh, why uh, that, that, uh, that record uh, is generated uh, in first place. Then finally, we provide this automatic fault localization uh, feature and basically, this feature is really similar to a test unit that you normally do in Scala or in Java. So when you have your application, you then write the test cases, right? And so this is basically writing test cases for your Spark application. And the nice feature about this system is that when we provide the application with your test phases, with your test cases, we are basically able to, in case the test is, not, is failing, we are able to provide you which is the minimum amount of input record that, uh, that generated failures. So in case your test is failing, instead of simply say, okay, your test is failing, we're actually telling you which are the minimum amount of record that generate the failure. And this kind of helps you because if you have like a really large data set, you don't have to kind of uh, sift through all the data set to kind of understand which is the, the record that generated the particular uh, error, but we're actually showing you um, uh, this for you. And how this system works basically is a combination about, uh, there's a combination of data provenance and uh, a sort of, um, binary search. So for the data provenance, uh, basically when you run your application and you have your, uh, uh, you have your record that generated the test failure, the data provenance is basically able to tell you which are all the intermediate and input record that generated a particular uh, uh, wrong uh, record. The fact is that with the data provenance, it can, even the amount of record that it can generate can be really large and it's really difficult to, for um, a user to kind of read all this record to understand which is the original cause of the problem. So we went a little bit uh, beyond this and implemented this uh, delta debugging algorithm that as I said is really similar to binary search. Just to give you uh, an idea, uh, basically you can, we, we start with uh, the initial input uh, data set and you run your application with the test case and eventually the test, the test case uh, is failing, right? And what we do next, we split the data set in two, and then we run again the, the two different data set, the application on top of your, uh, these two different data set, and we apply the test function to see which is this, the, 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 the smaller data set that is causing the failure. Uh, and then we continue this process until, until we find the, which is the minimum amount of, uh, of, uh, of records that uh, generate the particular, uh, which is the failing cause of, uh, of your test. So the interesting part is that we kind of put some clever optimization there, and basically we can give it to you this, uh, uh, the minimum amount of record just uh, uh, under the time of 63% uh, in average respect to the, the original time of, uh, of your input application. So that means it is, it's kind of a, a good result in the sense that when you run debugging uh, on your local mode, you expect your system to be two or three times lower respect to normal execution. Instead with this system, we are only 63%, uh, uh, it takes only 60% respect to the normal execution. Uh, now I'm gonna give this stage to Gulzar. They're gonna show you a little bit uh, all this feature in a demo. Okay, all right. So my name is Gulzar, graduate student from UCLA. And uh, I'll be giving a demonstration of the tool that Matteo just mentioned. So the running example that I'll be using is this one. We have a input data set where each row defines a information about the student for in a college. So the first name, uh, the first column is the serial numbers, uh, second column is the name of the student, and then the year that the student is, uh, is in, and the date of birth. And the program that we have written for this uh, data set computes the average age of the student per college year. So eventually what we have is a year of the college, a freshman, junior, senior, or a sophomore, and the average age for all the students for that particular year. So that's an example that I'm gonna be using throughout this uh, demonstration. So let's just move over to the UI that Big Debug offers and uh, the one that the user can use to interact with this uh, interface. So this is what we have uh, as a user interface for Big Debug. It provides, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the directed acyclic graph of the workflow that the user have run. 
In this case, uh, I'm using the same running example. And each of these nodes is color coded. So a red one denotes a transformation which has been crashed because of some uh, exception or some other kind of error, error because of the data set or from, from the logical implementation of the program. A green uh, node here represents a watch point. So a watch point, uh, similar to what Matteo had explained earlier, gives you a snapshot of a, the data records that are flowing between certain transformations. And a yellow node rep here represents a breakpoint is in place. And also, you can see on the right-hand side a code editor window where you can see the actual line where the crash had occurred and the place where the breakpoint is in place. So like uh, Matteo said earlier, breakpoint does not, does not actually pause the computation on the cloud, but uh, it gives a simulation that the breakpoint is in place. So the user can interact with this uh, whole UI just similar to as a user would interact with a GDB kind of debugger in the, in the command line. So let's just move on to, or I'm gonna show you uh, what's inside these watch points. So a watch point uh, gives you a snapshot of whatever the records that are flowing between uh, two transformations. It also provides a code editor window. So here you can actually update this guard on the fly. So watch point takes in a filter function. And you can update this function, uh, filter function on the fly when the job is actually running. And once this filter function is provided, you can, uh, it, uh, the big debug would compile this code and send it to all the workers, and from that point onwards, all the workers would use this new filter function to capture the records. So let's just uh, run, I'm gonna run this program again and show you how this particular feature would work. And I, I have already compiled a code snippet for this uh, update of the function, so I'll, I'm just gonna use that. Go back to this function here, update this UI, and I have compiled this function already, so I'm gonna submit this new guard. This guard would, uh, this function would then be compiled and sent to all the workers. And if I go back in here, watch point, you can see that the previous function was used to capture the records, and then when I update the new function, from that point onwards, the new function was used on all the workers uh, to capture the records that are being flowing between these certain transformations. So you can update this guard on the fly. One thing that you can see here is that, so first uh, key, if, so first value in this, uh, in this tuple was the year the student was in, and the second value was age, so you can see that all the ages are inactive. And the job has already been running, so you can just go back, and this would give, lead us to a, the second feature that we uh, said earlier about the real-time code fix. So the breakpoint is in place at uh, this point, and it gives a user a feature that you can actually update any of the following transformations by updating the function that you have provided earlier at the compile time. So we're just gonna go inside the map and fix the edges that were in negative. So we were computing the average age of the students here. Now we will fix that error and also compute the average age. So I've already compiled the snippet here. I'm just gonna copy it here again. So in this case, I'm computing the same average, but I'm also uh, multiplying the negative one here so that all the ages could be in positive. So I'm gonna patch this code. Again, Big Debug would compile this code on the local machine and send it to all the workers. And all the workers would then have this newly uh, supplied code. And since the breakpoint is in place, the execution has been stopped at this point. I'm gonna press resume here. And the new function that I have submitted uh, recently was, is gonna use to, uh, gonna try, uh, use to uh, compute the new results. And whatever, the, I'm gonna show you the results here that I have in the command line window. So as you can see, the results are all in positive. Previously, if I would have pressed resume without actually changing the function, it would have given me a negative average ages for all the function. So this is the real-time code fix that we can do if we have a simulated breakpoint in place. So let's just uh, go into the crash culprit uh, feature. So I'm gonna run this program again. I have. Uh, an, in the second map operation, I'm actually parsing the age of the students using the date of birth. And if there is a, uh, like a letter that is not uh, converted into an integer, it would throw me an integer exception. 
So I've run the program again, and I'm going to refresh this UI. So now you can see that uh, this particular map operation has failed. I'm going to go inside and see what are the record that has, uh, that has caused the program to fail. So in this case, you can see that the program was expecting this record to be a date of birth, but this is a actual age and has letters in it. Uh, so it was not, uh, the map function was not able to compile uh, or parse this particular string. So right now we have three features. We can either modify this record, submit it back into the pipeline, or we can skip this record entirely. So I'm gonna skip this record, and as soon as, uh, as I skip this record and press resume here, because we already have a breakpoint uh, in place, so we're gonna resume it again. And whatever the results that I would get here would not, so the record that I have skipped does not, did, didn't really contribute towards uh, the output of this final result. So using this feature, you can actually uh, ignore all the records that are causing your program to fail or crash. And as soon as we see that uh, crashing record, uh, the, the, the workers will keep on processing the rest of the records that are cracked. So I will run this program again and see, uh, show you how we can use the backward tracing feature of Big Debug. So I'm gonna update this program again. And go into the same map operation where the crash had occurred. Uh, in this map operation, uh, you can see the record that I've already shown you. You, you might have uh, wondered that if we have more than like 100 records which are crashing, it's like really hard for a user to manually skip or modify them on the fly. So what we provide here is a is a function that you, a user can use to actually update all of these records uh, in a batch mode on their appropriate workers. So we can provide a function here. This function will be compiled, sent to all the workers, and then the crashing record at each worker will then use this map, uh, this function to actually modify them uh, at each uh, worker. So I'm gonna use this trace to input button to perform backward tracing on this particular crash causing record. So as soon as I press this button, uh, I will move back to the, the command line where I've actually run the job. And you can see here that this is actually the record which is causing the, that particular map operation to fail. And this rec record was retrieved after performing these backward traces across several transformations. So this was the second last uh, feature that I wanted to show you. The last feature I wanted to show you is a automated debugging feature that Matteo had mentioned. Uh, so we're gonna move on to the Zeppelin interface of uh, this uh, feature. And let me just run that here. Right, so this is the program. So we're gonna demonstrate uh, how a user can automatically debug the programs, the Spark program, given that uh, he or she, the user, can identify which are the outputs are incorrect. So we're gonna do some setup here, defining some interfaces. Uh, I'm gonna run this thing first. And so these are just, just some libraries and interfaces that we need for this particular feature to work. And this is a program. So this program is similar to the running example that I have uh, explained earlier, com computing the average age for students uh, per college year. So we're gonna run this program and All right, so here we're gonna run this program and get the output. So as you can see here, uh, that the age of the senior year student is actually smaller than the age of the junior year student. So a user might uh, suspect that this might be a suspicious out output and let's debug this and see what is the reason behind having greater average age for junior year students. So we're gonna write this test function and tell the, this particular automatic debugging tool that the age 
if the age of the student for junior year is greater than 23, we're gonna set this to a false, like test is failing for uh, a record which has greater than 23 age. So we're gonna run this program here and execute this test function and find out the, so we're gonna use this test function to perform automated debugging by applying data provenance first, using backward tracing, get some input records that are still not minimum to, uh, and it's still not minimum enough to, for a user to actually sift through uh, manually. And then we apply delta debugging. So first, let me run, so we're gonna run both of these processes simultaneously. So this is what we are getting first. Applying backward tracing on junior year students gives us all the student information and all the students which are in junior year. And this is uh, huge, it could be, for this uh, particular small sub, uh, data set, this is just like 500 records, but think of it in a, like terabytes of data set, it's gonna be like billions of records. And we still want the precise record which is causing the program to produce an incorrect output. So after getting this subset of uh, input data set, we're gonna apply delta debugging, which apply binary search-like strategy on, the, on this particular data set to find the precise input record which is causing the program to produce a faulty output. And we, come, we have come up with this uh, set of optimization that makes this process really, really fast. So I've already done this uh, data provenance plus delta debugging thing, and let's just move into end and okay, all right. So so eventually, delta debugging finds the exact input records that is, that is causing the program to produce the failure-inducing output, which was age for junior year students greater than the age of uh, senior year students, and this was the culprit where we have date of birth equal to zero, 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 and when we subtract that from the current age, it gives us like really high value for the age for junior year students. So yeah, so this is the final feature that we had in this demonstration. Uh, thank you for listening to us, and we'll be happy to take any questions. If uh, okay, so there are microphones uh, on both sides of the auditorium, so please come up to one of those to ask your question. Quick question, you yeah. showed uh, Spark 1.2, do you yeah, support a few uh, newer So versions? yeah, we built this project uh, two years ago actually, and so we did a couple of papers on top of that. Uh, this was built for 1.2.1. Currently we are working on moving it to 2.1, and uh, yeah, this was tightly integrated within Spark, so it would take us some time to re redesign this whole process so that we can create a package, external package, and take it out of the Spark runtime. So exactly, that's what you, we are working on, and yeah, uh, in a couple of months, we will be ready to like, ship uh, it for 2.1 okay. Spark. One, one other question. Sure. You, it showed you, when you say that you are pausing the program mm -hmm. uh, and restarting it. Are you yeah. saving the data at that point and then? So we are, so for simulated breakpoint, we're not actually pausing the program itself on all the workers. What we give is a, a like a illusion for a user to think of it as a breakpoint. Okay. Uh, because we thought that the user would be similar for a, would be similar to a GDB kind of debugger so that it would like do step by step breakpoint debugging. And we provide that in this case. But in the background, we are not actually touching the original job. The original job is still running, but as soon as the user changes the workflow or uh, do a step over, then we have to restart it from the latest materialization point just to reuse the, uh, or recreate the program state for that so particular break. So you're break saving point. the data at that point so you can restart oh, we it? Are re we are leveraging the materialization point at uh, Shuffle. Got it, thanks. Um, just to the uh, question about uh, uh, kind of Spark 1.2.1 and uh, collaboration. I saw that you have your code as just a tarball today. Are you looking to put it on GitHub for Absolutely, collaboration? Absolutely, yeah, we are, we are, yeah, I'm spending my whole summer just to work on this project and to give it, uh, produce an open source version with all this Titian and uh, Big Debug and a couple more other projects that we're thinking of. Very cool, thank you. Awesome ideas. Thank you. Hi, um, so um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll, I'll just try to pick one or two. So does this work with Spark SQL? Uh, sorry? Does this work with Spark SQL? So this, so we build this thing for the core, uh, like package for of Spark. Uh, I think it should work for Spark SQL yeah, as have, well. Uh, yeah. yeah, we have one student that is working on the, bringing the provenance, actually it's over there, bringing the provenance over Spark SQL. 
And then this is the first step. It will also enable all the other features on top of that. So we're okay. working on that. Thank you. And um, uh, one of a, a, a real world use case uh, that we have is say computing the histogram of a, a distribution of strings in like um, an enormous data set mm -hmm. where there is a huge skew towards one or two keys and that slows down the entire job. I was wondering if this can help identify not just broken records per se, but records that are just dominating the computation. Uh, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, in order to do that, you should use like the sketches. There are specific sketches that are able to detect heavy eaters. So uh, there are specific data structure used to, for detecting heavy eaters. I remember that you were also on my talk yesterday, yeah. and we also have one data structure that is able to detect heavy eaters. So that is more like related to query planning than uh, this kind of debugging okay. uh, features. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I have a question. So it looks like it's working in the yarn client mode, right? Or the standalone. It's, it's a standalone cluster mode. Oh, uh, standalone. I have two workers running on my machine okay. in different uh, processes mm -hmm. and a one driver node. Yeah. So does it work with yarn client mode or cluster mode? Uh, I, think I, think, I think it should work, yeah. Uh, we haven't tried it, but it, it should work because we haven't... Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, so... We think it, 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 sh it should work for Yarn, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, quick question uh, about this. Uh, did, did, did this support the Py, uh, Python code? No, so we only support Scala and Java as for now. Yeah. Oh, just, okay, just, just Scala. Scala and Java for now. Okay. But yeah, in the latest version, we are actually moving to a Zeppelin note, uh, notebook. So okay. I think eventually we will support Python as well, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question is about uh, do this support the uh, uh, IBM Spectrum? You know, we're running on the on the Power 8 cluster. Is that what we'll be working on also there? I'm not sure about mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm not of Spectrum. Uh, so uh, yeah, maybe we can talk later to discuss like okay. how we can support this on Spectrum as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what is you, uh, what is your ongoing efforts on this project? Uh, you uh, could you explain about more. You briefly mentioned that uh, you are implementing to new version? Yes, so our target for by the end or the start of next, uh, next fall is to have this tool working for 2.1 Spark or the latest version we have up, up to that point. We want to, right now it's tightly integrated within the core runtime of Spark. We wanted to take it out of uh, Spark as well, create some external packages and uh, have this debugger. Right now it's, we're extending the original UI of, uh, of Spark that the Spark provides. We wanted to integrate this thing into a like interactive notebook to support that. Uh, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. And th does it mean that it come either come with the next version of Spark or do we have separate uh, what kind of packages to use? Yeah, so I think by creating an external package for this particular project would definitely help us to support this tool for every version of uh, Spark. Okay, thank yeah. you. That, that's the goal of creating it as an external package. I, uh, so I wanted to talk about that simulated breakpoint. You yeah. said you don't stop the computation. So right. if the user waits, the process might complete? Absolutely. Or? So uh, what on the UI, it seems like that the process has been stopped and the user won't see the results until or unless he or she presses a resume button or do a step over kind of debugging. So, yeah, from the from the user's perspective, without seeing the console, it seems like the breakpoint, uh, similar to a breakpoint that a user usually see in like IDEs or uh, JDB debuggers. But won't the Spark job complete like, yeah. and shut down? It Is won't it shut down. It would wait for the user to press, to take action, either a resume. So if a user presses resume and the job has already been completed, it would right away show the results. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and if the user do step over, then the things have changed, so we have to restart the program just to show the user the new program state for the new breakpoint, because the breakpoint has moved one step forward. Okay. okay. So we have details of all of these things in, a, in our ICSI submission uh, international conference for software engineering. All of these details are in there if you want to go into like how we implemented this and what exactly uh, these things implement. Okay. Thank you. Just a follow up to, to this guy's question. So um, how does that interact with 
uh, file output operations at the end of the job. If you, I'm sorry, if you modify the code because mm -hmm. uh, you find some bad records or something, does it just so modification the file of the output? modification of the code is mainly for the purpose of compensating for something uh, which was wrong in the at the program state. Right. So we are not. I mean, you can still use it to implement something new, but we want a user to give us. Uh, like a remediation code to fix the program on the fly. Right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, let's say your program, the uh, job includes, like, as its output operation, a file, saving a file. Mm -hmm. um, will it rewrite that file with the new records if you modify them? If you modify it, the it program? Won't, it won't write. Uh, it would wait for the user to press resume or step over to actually write it on the file. Okay, so it yeah. doesn't write the output. Until it doesn't write the output. It would hold back till the user takes oh, action. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank That's you. all the time we have for questions for now. Uh, and if you have further questions, you can ask the speakers afterwards. So uh, let's give them one final round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.